Coming up on this episode of the R Podcast, we'll be talking more in depth on using the R Markdown package for reproducible reports, along with some really interesting extensions of using that package. I'll also highlight some new developments in the R community, as well as some of the biggest news stories with respect to this year in terms of using R in industry. So without further ado, here we go with episode 14. Are you ready? Welcome to the R Podcast. To say it's been a while would be a gross understatement. Um, so we've had obviously a bit of a layoff, but it's great to be back. I'm your host, Eric Nance, and I'd imagine a lot of you are probably listening to my my show for the first time, given the extremely long layoff. But for those of you that listened to the first uh, 13 episodes before this point, welcome back. And it's really great to have you uh, listening again. And for those, again, for those of you that are new um, to this show, I definitely invite you to check out the um, archived episodes on our website, which is r-podcast.org. You'll find the previous 13 episodes. And in the very first episode, I gave a pretty um, lengthy introduction on my previous history of how I got into using R and how it's become so important in my both my uh, personal interests as well as my work these days. Um, so I'd invite you to check that episode out if you kind of want to know a little bit more about me personally. Um, but as I, as you, as you, as listeners that have already um, listened to the show previously know, it has been a long time since the last episode. And ironically, the last episode, um, episode 13, was definitely one of my highlights of the entire run because it was an interview with Ihui Sia, who, of course, is the author of the Knitter Package and now is actually working for our studio um, permanently. Um, He's been involved with a lot of the interesting work with our main topic for today, as well as some really um, nice contributions with using, you know, HTML within R, specifically within the Shiny framework and these um, concept of HTML widgets. Um, he's been at the forefront of many of those efforts. So I really thought that interview was really, you know, one of the highlights, of, again, of my previous run. So um, I think I would definitely invite you to check that out if you haven't had a listen to that as well. Um, I kind of bring that up because as I relaunch the R podcast, I'm definitely going to be putting more emphasis on getting more interviews um, with the the R community in general. I mean, a lot of the big names, you know, who knows what we have in the future, um, so to speak. But I definitely will be reaching out to others that have either built some really innovative packages or they've done some really interesting analysis or maybe they've tied using R with some other interesting tools. Um, so I'll be definitely trying to get some of those uh, influential members on on the R podcast as we go on. Um, in terms of the format of the show, it will primarily still be an audio um, focus for the podcast. Um, that's honestly a lot easier to do in terms of production uh, from a production standpoint. But I do want to also still provide screencasts as appropriate especially when I start diving into some topics where I want to show off, you know, using some R code or how it, how it runs and what kind of output we see. Um, and I'll probably be using R Studio for a lot of those demonstrations. But I also, as, as I start the R podcast again, I definitely want to start showcasing when you tie in R with some other really interesting tools especially in the open source framework, you can really do some really powerful analyses that way. Um, so we'll see how that goes in terms of where I, where I um, weave that in. But I've been 
as far as my my work's concerned, I've been tying R of a lot of interesting technologies, and it's been it's been a great learning experience. And I definitely want to share some some of the things I've learned along with all of you. Also, kind of from an administrative standpoint, I am in the process of revising the the home site of of this show. Right now, um, we are using WordPress for the hosting. Um, I should say it's a WordPress blog I host myself, but I'm becoming a little less enamored with WordPress and not so much a fault for their own because they've done such critical work and making it easier for, a, you know, somebody who doesn't necessarily have great expertise in web development to put on a nice blog or and with relatively little effort. Um, I guess what I'm thinking is I'd like to have a little more control over the formatting and also kind of get away from some of the overhead that WordPress has in terms of always requiring a database and that being a very attractive target for hackers. Um, in fact, for those of you that listened to the show previously, I had attempted to use a forum on our on the R podcast site. And that was uh, hacked somewhat quickly, even with my measures to, you know, beef up the security. So I am moving into a slightly different direction for the site, although by the time you listen to this, it may not be live yet. Um, But regardless, no matter which version of the site that we'll have, you know, in terms of, you know, the production version, you'll be able to access all the episodes along with the additional resources that can be helpful. I could go on more, but I think it's time to kind of dive into our our main topic for today, and that's a deeper dive using our markdown. All right, so actually in the previous run of the podcast, I was starting a quote-unquote series on the on the concept of reproducible analysis using R. And we had talked previously about how S-Weave was kind of the first generation of this concept where you could tie R analyses and embed them into a LaTeX, you know, coded document and have the results compiled for you once you, you know, compiled the document itself with the embedded R chunks. And obviously, since um, S-Weave or Sweave, um, the biggest revelation in the past uh, two or three years has definitely been the Knitter package, which, uh, as I mentioned before, has been developed by Ehuisia. And that, frankly, is kind of the engine for a lot of the key, you know, reproducible analysis frameworks that I'll be talking about today. And Knitter itself, like I said, has been a big innovation, but... I think things took took another level when our studio had produced the R Markdown package a, about a year or maybe a year and a half ago. I, I lose track of when it actually came out. But this really uses Knitter under the hood, so to speak, but it's also tying in another um, very powerful open source uh, software package called Pandoc to actually help you convert your input document that you write in what's called the R Markdown format and be able to convert it to not only HTML, but also into PDF format, and that's using LaTeX on on the back end. And interestingly enough, you can also convert to a uh, Microsoft Word document format, the uh, .docx format. And this was... This was always possible before, even outside of using R Markdown, if you knew how to kind of use Pandoc from the command line. And I believe even in Knitter, in some of the earlier versions, uh, we did tie using Pandoc with that. But now it's become a lot more streamlined and a lot easier to use. Now, to me, this feature cannot be understated, um, really kind of due to, I guess I'll give my perspective on this. Um, in my in my work, I deal primarily in a you know Microsoft type shop, albeit we have a really nice you know resource in terms of our high performance computing environment that is running Linux. But in terms of collaborating with other team members, especially the non statisticians, I'm pretty much confined to using Word documents or PowerPoint presentations. Um, so in respect to the document side of things, the fact that 
our markdown makes it seamless for me to produce not only a nice looking kind of HTML version of the report, but also the Word document version. That to me is, is just a, a really big time saving. And I can just email or, or directly give this uh, Word document version to a colleague and then they can do whatever they like in terms of providing comments back to me and things like that. But Again, that just speaks to how powerful this Pandoc package is that our Markdown is using to, to make this a seamless thing. Um, so my purpose of today's episode is not so much to really give a tutorial on using our Markdown in general, because frankly speaking, that's already been done very effectively um, by the folks at our studio themselves. Um, when you look at the show notes associated with this episode, you're going to find um, a few resources, first of which is the R Markdown home site, which kind of aggregates all the concepts and background of Markdown in general and the types of output documents that you can produce with R Markdown. There are very detailed sections associated with all that. But for those of you that like learning via a, a, like a video demonstration, um, our studio has put out um, a couple webinars on using R Markdown. I have both of those linked in the show notes as well, one of which is kind of getting started with it, which is probably the one you'd want to visit first. And then um, one that came later on is basically a, a more broader discussion on how you can escape the land of LaTeX or Microsoft Word for statistical reporting. Um, Yihui was a primary talker on that on that webinar, and it was, it was very well done. But it kind of speaks to the fact that not only can you do what I'll call static reports of R Markdown, you can also do interactive reports as well um, use, that ties in with the Shiny framework. And that to me is kind of the next, I think, major th iteration of reporting in general is how we bring in these kind of interactive features with, with communicating results to our colleagues uh, that we're dealing with. So. I definitely invite you to check out those webinars if um, our markdown is new to you. And alongside those, um, our studio has also produced um, a nice uh, PDF of a cheat sheet that you could, you know, obviously print and have it at your desk and just kind of look up things as you go along. And they've also down, um, produced a reference guide, which is a more in-depth kind of PDF document that gets to a lot of the different options in more detail. Um, so our, our markdown, the package itself is, is still, I would say, evolving in terms of getting some newer features. But right now it's obviously, you know, ready to use. It is on CRAN and it's also, you know, seamlessly integrated into the RStudio environment. Not that you need RStudio to use it, but it definitely feels like a even more integrated experience when you, when you use RStudio to produce your R markdown documents. Uh, one of the newer features I'm keeping an eye on and kind of experimenting with with uh, a project at work is the concept of parameterized reports. And this, basically what this is, is when you define an R Markdown document, you put a lot of the kind of custom options for your output and for the document in general in the header section of the document. And you'll see, you know, if you've, followed our markdown before that this header section is called YAML. That's actually standing for, I believe, YAML is yet another markup language. Don't quote me on that, but I heard that from someone else. But the idea is that you can write these, these directives or these options in plain text language and the machine, i.e. The, the R interpreter is going to interpret that as options to put in the compilation of your R Markdown document. So anyway, my point with that is, is our studio has introduced a feature called parameterized reports, where in addition to the typical options for your document, you can put basically any set of options as special parameters in this header. And then you can basically link in your document processing via the typical code chunks, you can obtain those options and that can be a nice way to kind of ease the process of editing your document but also giving a little customization to run it in different situations. 
And so, like I said, I haven't used this a lot primarily other than exploring this in one particular project. But this, this could be a nice way to kind of do different versions of a report and still use basically uh, one master set of the report file itself or one particular file because these parameters could also be specified when you render the document via the um, appropriate enough the render function within our markdown the R markdown package so you could actually call out different versions of these parameters in the function call so to me this is a a unique opportunity to do kind of a a batch set of maybe 10 reports that each require maybe a different data set or maybe a different variable within a data set. And in that way, you could still have potentially one master source file, the R markdown file, and not have like 10 of these just because you change like one variable in the data set. Um, so like I said, I need to explore this a little more, but I think that could be a really interesting feature for um, some next versions of reports that I'll be creating and maybe others in the community will find useful as well. Um, so that's kind of more getting into our markdown itself. Now my what I want to talk about next is some kind of nice, I don't know if I should call it extensions, but nice kind of utilities that you can, you know, enhance your R markdown experience or, you know, the, the outputs you get from R markdown. I first want to talk about the concept of being able to view your rendered version, and th this will mostly um, apply to your rendered HTML version of the report, kind of in a real-time setting. So to give a little background on this, um, in just in general computing, the markdown format has you know really taken off in terms of a very attractive you know input format for creating documents. And there are some software packages out there that will let you, you know, that are kind of, you know, geared towards creating markdown and that it will not only do some syntax highlighting as appropriate, you know, use though some of the packages will have some nice buttons to put different elements of markdown like headers or bullet list or, you know, code chunks or itemized, you know, et cetera. And some of these editors will come in with a built-in in essence, web, I hate to say server, but a renderer, if you will, so that as you're dynamically editing the uh, markdown file on another section of the editor, you can see your rendered kind of web-ready version of the document in real time. And this is great as you're like trying out different formatting things or trying out, you know, different layouts, maybe even different styles of the document that you can see that feedback in real time. So by default, when you use our markdown, whether it's within our studio or even outside of our studio, um, as you save that file, you have to somehow compile the document to get the, uh, the rendered version of that that you can view. And typically, like I said, that's either pushing a button or running a function, and it's not really in real time as you're editing that you can see this vin finished version of the output. Um, but what what's an interesting utility um, package um, that has even a more general use than just this? Um, Ihuisia, again, the author of Knitter, has created another package called ServR or Server. I'm not sure how you want to pronounce it. It's spelled S E R V R, and I have the link to its uh, GitHub repository in the show notes. But this package gives you the capability of within R itself to basically spin up a web server kind of dynamically um, without w without leaving R itself. So he's built in a, a few different custom functions to do different things with this. And one of those things would be to basically render an R markdown document and have and if you're using R Studio, you'll be able to have, say, on your right side of the R Studio panel, you could have basically the rendered version of the document in the uh, what's called the viewer portion. And then as you're editing the document on the left, the typical R Markdown file, as you hit save, you're going to see these edits render in real time because the server process is basically going to compile the package for you. 
uh, or not the package, it's going to compile the report for you by you having to hit another button after saving. And so it's really nice just to kind of see the impact of your changes in a real time format. And I was using this even outside of a typical R Markdown document when I was um, preparing an internal presentation on using R, you know, some intermediate concepts. I was actually using a framework called a Solidify. And for those interested, I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Um, but basically, I wanted a way to render the slides in like a viewer tab as I was making changes so that I could, you know, see the layout, how it was impacted. And, and I was doing a lot of customized things. So I, a lot of times I didn't want to have to wait to compile it with a, you know, a, a function call or things like that. I want to just see it in real time. So the server package was extremely helpful to make that a robust process. Um, the next thing I'll, I'll mention is how you create tables in an R Markdown document. Um, the concept of tables in Markdown in general has, has gotten some attention in that there hasn't been a lot of customization you could do with it outside the box, so to speak. Um, you, they're usually kind of limited to having like one particular column row and then, you know, you know, or, you know, a pretty standard layout. But you can augment, um, you can make it easier to create, you know, tables in our markdown format um, for your for your output pretty easily using a couple of interesting um, extensions or functions that I found along the way. Um, there is a package called Pandur that's spelled P-A-N-D-E-R. And this is a totally separate package from our markdown or from Knitter but it offers some really interesting ways you can create more customized versions of these tables in Markdown format. You can do things like doing different, you know, font types and the header rows. You can do, you know, wrapping of rows or merging cells. There's, there's lots of interesting things you can do. Um, so, and also it's nice that you can actually render output from a, from a statistical function in R, such as, um, for example, the linear model function, the LM function, it has some built-in routines for putting the results of that in an R markdown friendly format. And if this functionality sounds familiar, yeah, you could say this is similar to what the X table package has done for a long time, which would turn, say, output from, again, a linear model type function to a friendly format for either a LaTeX document or an HTML document. But I think Pander offers a lot more customization. You can build on those things. And again, Xtable was obviously built well before Markdown was a thing, at least in the R community. So Pander is kind of taking some interesting concepts that Xtable has, but also kind of beefs it up to another level for using um, within the R, the R Markdown framework. And so I've been able to do that pretty effectively with using some statistical models functions and be able to render that pretty um, nicely without with pretty little effort, just maybe customizing a few functions in the Pander uh, package from here or there. But and it was a pretty seamless thing. So if you're having trouble making more customized versions of tables, I will definitely invite you to check out the Pander package um, for some nice utilities to make make that easier for you. And then even within the Knitter package itself, uh, Ewe has developed a function called Cable, and that's spelled with a K instead of a like a C if you're thinking cable is in like a, a wire or something. Um, but that I think that was just a play on words for tying Knitter and Table together. But again, you'd have to ask him. Um, but anyway, that 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 function basically kind of lets renders the um, the summary of interest maybe it's a snippet of a data frame or something like that but it's kind of smart enough to know based on the output format you're targeting at the time to put the rendered text into a format that's friendly for that so no matter if you're doing an html output a pdf output or even a word document output um, you just have to use the cable pack the cable function without doing a whole lot of customization, you'll get a, a pretty nice looking table from that. 
Um, there, there's a little bit of customization you can do, but it's probably not as in depth as what you can do with the Pander package. But if you're just doing a very simple, like I said, maybe a snippet of a data frame, you know, of whatever result that is, um, you should be able to do it pretty easily with the cable package and, and or not, not package, the cable function and get a pretty nice uh, format from that. Um, so, but um, even in a recent webinar that Ihui did with respect to our markdown, um, he even acknowledged that getting you know, more customized versions of tables is admittedly a pretty difficult process if you want to do some really uh, fancy things. So if, if you are looking to do these very um, intricate formats for your tables, then maybe Markdown might not be for you if you can't find, you know, the equivalent functionality you need in like the Pander package or, or the cable function. So I'll just put that disclaimer up front. But um, for me, I don't usually have to do a whole lot of, you know, fancy layouts or tables or things like that. But I'm sure some of you listening are probably doing some more complex layouts. So um, just just kind of keep that stuff in mind. Um, the, the last kind of major extension I'll highlight um, that I have a lot of experience with is, again, getting back to this concept of being able to target multiple output formats kind of at the same time with our markdown and the different things you can do with that. Um, one of the problems I had initially is that I might do a specific summary that looks really nice on in the HTML format because obviously a web page doesn't have the concept of margin widths or, or just, you know, it just looks cleaner a lot of times. But then I would do a similar summary in like the Word document format and it just would look kind of terrible. So I was I was kind of struggling with how do I do different versions of outputs that are going to at least either look nice in both or at the very least do a version that's optimized for one and a version that's optimized in the other. And in the past, what I was doing, I was making basically two separate R markdown files tailored for each of these output files, which frankly speaking was quite inefficient because I don't want to have to maintain two for the most part identical types of files and just have some change because of it's either a table being formatted or, or some kind of verbatim output or things like that that I didn't want to have to deal with maintaining multiple versions because uh, I have a hard enough time keeping track of stuff that's just one version but anyway so as I was struggling with this problem of how do I deal with these out, out multiple output formats um, along the way, I saw this really nice blog post by Tyler Rinker, um, who wrote this, this blog post about how you can alter the action in R, in your R markdown document that depends on what document format you're actually using. So the way you pull this off is actually not too difficult, although it's one of those things where unless someone, in this case, this originally on a Stack Overflow post, unless you know, this was more um, disclosed broadly. I don't know how I would have stumbled on this myself, but if you put in kind of one of your beginning code chunks in your R Markdown document, I usually call one of these like setup or something because I'm either loading data sets or defining some constants that are going to be used throughout. Um, you can use a function within Knitter. Um, it's the ops underscore knit um, and then dollar sign get. That's basically kind of getting the value of a particular um, parameter that's being used in the compilation, but you can get a parameter that's called rmarkdown.pandoc.2. You can assign that to a, a, a typical you know, variable, and that's gonna basically render to whatever output format is being produced at that time. And don't worry, I'll have the actual code chunk I'm referring to in the show notes, so don't, don't, you don't have to write it down right now by any means. Um, but based on getting that, that value, you can actually do some conditional logic within the remaining portions of your R Markdown document to do some different processing. Um, so he's got some example, uh, Tyler's got some examples on his blog posts of, I believe, ways that you can embed a, a online video in your document because you have to do things differently for PDF versus Word and HTML. But this has been really useful to me in the sense that 
I may have to do a different version of a table that looks better in Word than it does because I have to do some things differently for the Word format. Whereas in the HTML format, I might be able to do things a little simpler because it will just look nicer there too. Um, so I, I really like this functionality to be able to minimize, you know, code redundancy as best as I can, i.e. not having multiple versions of the source file depending on the output format. But instead, within the code chunks themselves, I can use like an if, else if, lot, you know, um, structure. I can use a switch statement, you know, depending on how complicated I want to make it and be able to pull off this idea of creating an attractive output format that looks good no matter which format I'm, I'm choosing. So while you can't really get around doing a little more code, so to speak, you can still at least make, you know, do some kind of processing and let your, let the um, R markdown logic be able to determine the best ways of handling that output format depending on the directives you give it. So frankly, those, those few um, kind of enhancements or kind of extensions are ones that I've used to help um, enhance my R Markdown experience. And frankly, I haven't even touched on the concept of bringing interactivity with R Markdown, which is something I, I'm starting to explore a little bit, although I, I need to, to do more of it before I can really speak you know, more clearly on it. Um, but I'll have I'll have a couple a link or two in the show notes about using Shiny as what's called a runtime environment for your R Markdown document, so that you can put the nice little Shiny type widgets and you know do the dynamic or reactive outputs within your R Markdown document itself. So it's kind of a it really is a hybrid between a flow blown Shiny you know Shiny uh, a Shiny interface and also an R Markdown type document. So there's there's some really interesting things you can do. And R Studio has put some good resources about that on the R Markdown home site that you can check out. Uh, one blog post I came recently just before starting recording of this was um, how you can um, let HTML widgets render correctly if you're using Knitter and R Markdown in general to produce say a, a website or a blog using the popular Jekyll framework. And while I'm not doing anything with Jekyll myself, I kind of like the idea of learning about this concept in more detail in case I do touch on things like this in the future. Um, so I'll have that link in the show notes as well. So I don't, I don't believe I'll be having a screencast for today's episode because a lot of these were just concepts I wanted to kind of talk about in general terms. Um, but I would invite you to check out the show notes for more detailed examples on some of the things I, I've talked about. Um, so yeah, so I think that will do it for the main topic. And up next, we're going to dive into our, our community roundup. All right, so with the uh, very extended layoff, I could have had a, a huge list here because as the R community has expanded in an almost exponential format and a lot of the innovations have been you know, coming left and right, I, I would probably do another podcast for three, you know, four hours just on that alone. Um, what I am going to highlight are actually some of the more interesting developments in terms of connecting with the community that I've seen lately. And, and also some kind of cool events happening as well. So first, I'm really excited to, to say that this isn't the only podcast in town anymore about R. Um, recently, there has been another um, podcast that started called the R Talk Podcast. And I'll link to that in the show notes. But that um, has a couple episodes done already. And they, they, in my opinion, they've done an excellent job and I definitely hope to keep, hope they keep up the great work and I'm hoping I can get in touch with the hosts in the near future. Maybe we can do something collaboratively in the near future. Um, but I wanted to mention they did some really nice, um, in-depth interviews with, uh, David Smith, who now works for Microsoft, which I'll get to in the news segment and, uh, Jenny Bryan 
over at the uh, University of, I believe, British Columbia, um, who's done some really interesting, you know, ways of giving a statistics course for, for graduate students, but putting a lot of her materials on GitHub and being able to share that with the community and bringing in some interesting ideas for, you know, how do we teach R more effectively in a more interesting way. So I definitely invite you to check out their podcast, especially for those interviews, because it's been it's been really entertaining to hear that so far. Um, another podcast that's not specifically focused on R directly, although it has come up quite a bit in their early episodes, is called the uh, Not So Standard Deviations podcast. And this is actually hosted by uh, Roger Pang and Hillary Parker. And they had an interesting episode, I believe it was episode two, if I recall correctly, talking about the impact of what's been called the Hadleyverse of R packages. And if you haven't heard that term before, that's basically because Hadley Wickham, who of course now works at our studio, has developed some of the more, you know, talked about in terms of um, R packages that have become made, um, those especially new to R, it makes it so much easier for them to do data processing and manipulation. And of course, he's the author of ggplot too. So we have, you know, innovative graphics at our fingertips. Um, so he's kind of developed this really interesting ecosystem that for me personally has made my package development a lot easier, not only my package development a lot easier, but my data analysis a lot easier as well. So they had an interesting discussion on that. And um, I definitely, again, invite you to check out their podcast, too, because they also dive in some real interesting statistical concepts as well. So that's more from the, obviously, the media side of things, if you will. Um, one site that I've really um, appreciated having that's launched, in fact, I can't really pinpoint when it exactly launched, but it's been a huge um, help for my work, is a site called Metacran. And what Metacran is is simply a more... Um, user-friendly interface to basically uh, the R package, you know, community, if you will. Um, it'll basically give you a dashboard of all the packages that are more recent, some of the more popular packages. And um, it's even got an API associated with this that will let you kind of, um, in essence, interrogate this our you know package ecosystem to get some interesting metrics around that and I, i've really been you know fascinated by how this has been developed and now i kind of use this all the time to search for packages and whenever you find a package that you want to learn more about if there's like a github repository associated with it you'll be able to find a direct link to that um, it's just a really nice kind of dashboard almost of, of package information and I think it's kind of a, a sign of the of the the time, so to speak, that now we're trying to figure that the art community is now trying to figure out ways of tying some concepts together that have initially been kind of difficult to grasp before. And so I definitely will have a link to Metacran in the show notes. Um, they also have a obviously an active GitHub repository associated with this. Um, but I, I would definitely um, check that out if you haven't seen that before. It's, again, been a, a great benefit um, in my, in my um, exploration of packages, kind of have this one central place to get some really detailed information. Um, this Another fascinating development that happened, I believe, a month or two ago, um, Hadley Wickham, who I just mentioned previously, recently conducted an Ask Me Anything um, session on Reddit. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Reddit before, but they often will find influential, possibly celebrities or other influential members and do an Ask Me Anything where people can just basically type in their question and Hadley's trying to respond to as many of them as he can. And as you can imagine, this was a very popular um, Ask Me Anything. And as I read through the aftermath of it, I found some really interesting tidbits on kind of Hadley's background and some of what his um, philosophies are in terms of teaching statistics and kind of where he wants R to go um, at, on the next level. And so I'll, I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. But like I said, there are some really interesting tidbits here and there that 
kind of opened my eyes a bit and gave me a little more insight to the things that Hadley is thinking about these days. And then the last thing I'll mention in our community round, roundup is um, in January um, 30 to 31st next in 2016, of course, that's coming not too far away, our studio is holding their first ever um, Shiny Developer Conference. And as I mentioned, this is the first ever. And when they um, mentioned this on their on their personal blog on ourstudio.com, I, I think it's sold out in terms of, well, first I'll mention they capped the number of attendees to 90 because I guess they want to keep it as a more focused group, especially it being the first time they're doing this. Well, it seems like they didn't anticipate the demand as as much demand as there was because in less than 24 hours, it was completely sold out. Um, so they, they even mentioned in a follow-up post that they were overwhelmed by this and that, you know, they'll definitely have a waiting list out there for those that can't attend or weren't able to register that if they do this again, they'll have a way of letting you know. So... Um, I, I'll mention this now. I mean, I'm hoping that I can pull this off, but I did register for it and I was lucky enough to get in one of the last, I believe, five or ten slots available at that time. I remember I, I had said to myself, I really want to attend this thing. So uh, I did get in and my plan is to attend this. And because as we'll explore more in the next set of episodes of this podcast, I'm really trying to take my um, expertise of Shiny to another level, especially as I'm using Shiny so much more in some of my day-to-day -day work in terms of trying to create really dynamic but also user-friendly interfaces that not only do maybe relatively simple statistical analysis, but also some really intricate analyses that are depending on a whole you know suite of different functions or different packages and tying that in with some of my, the infrastructure I'm able to work with in terms of an HPC environment. So there is, so this is definitely coming at a nice time for me because I think I could really benefit from hearing, you know, from obviously the folks at our studio who of course develop Shiny, they're going to be the ones primarily giving the workshops or the, or the um, tutorials at the, at this conference. So um, of course, as a side benefit, I'm going to do what I can to try and get some interviews with some of the attendees and hopefully with um, folks from our studio themselves. Um, I think that could be some really great content for the podcast as well. So to say I'm excited for this would be a gross understatement. I'm really pumped for this. Um, and hopefully it goes off as well as we all uh, we all hope it does. Um so if you're interested in kind of what topics they're going to talk about, I have a link in the show notes to their agenda, as well as a, a, a more general information on the conference. So I definitely um, I'm looking forward to it. And hopefully, like I said, I can bring some nice um, content back um, from this in terms of interviews and other you know tidbits here and there um, back to this podcast. Okay, so I think that'll wrap up our community roundup. And up next is our package pick. So our package pick today is actually, you know, somewhat tied with our main topic of using our markdown for creating these reproducible documents. And the package that I found, you know, pretty interesting in a project recently is called Captioner. And I'll have a link to this in the show notes as well, as well as the vignette um, that describes the usage of this. But you can think of Captioner as giving you a really flexible and robust mechanism to get something that a lot of people who've used LaTeX before have kind of taken for granted in terms of automatic numbering of figures and tables and doing some really interesting custom things in terms of these captions themselves. And so I've been trying to use this package for a project in which I'm trying to basically adapt what a previous um, you know, author did in terms of creating 
a reproducible document using the SWE framework, and they were targeting LaTeX, as uh, as you can imagine. And so what I've been trying to do is figure out if we convert this to R Markdown, how are what how what are what are the ways I can get the captions to kind of match up what they did before in the LaTeX framework? And so I was kind of struggling with this for a little bit until I saw um, the captioner package um, already available. And so I've been trying to. I've been using this, although I probably haven't been using the full extent of it yet, but I would inv invite you to check out the vignette because you can do so many interesting things with the captions. You can have multiple sets of captions. You may not want to get the numbering of tables and figures mixed up, so you want to be able to customize how, how they're kind of um, captioned separately. You may want to do references to the captions without displaying the full version of the citation, so to speak, and maybe do some different ways of numbering. So it gives you all sorts of different tricks or, or customizations you can do for the captions themselves. And so, I'll, like I said, I'll have a link to this in the show notes. But again, it's one of those things as we start using R Markdown more in, in terms of the R community, ways we can try and bring some extensions or some enhancements to ways that have been done in the traditional sense using things like LaTeX and S-Weave um, you know, kind of bring some of the features that maybe we were missing before back into this framework and still get the benefit of coding in the friendly markdown format versus the uh, heavily verbose you know, LaTeX format. Um, if you listen to my previous episodes, I kind of gave my two cents on LaTeX, so I won't do that point here. But it, it, it served its purpose for me back a, a while back, but now I'm ready to kind of use Markdown full time because it just makes things so much easier for me. Um, so, yeah, again, we'll have a link to that package in the show notes. So uh, we'll have one more topic to talk about, and that will be a roundup of the R News. All right, so as I mentioned back when we were doing the community roundup, when you have a layoff of, you know, over two years, you can you could follow uh, the whole another episode just along with the major events, you know, with R itself. Obviously, we've had many releases since we last talked, um, but I'll highlight a couple of stories that kind of get to the real big, the much bigger influence I think is happening in terms of R's relationship with industry. Um, as, as I talked about maybe in the very early episodes of the R podcast, um, R itself, of course, originated from, you know, academia and it was written by statisticians for statisticians. And of course, as time has gone on, you know, it's really started to branch out of just being used as this academic research tool, but also powering some, you know, very critical analyses and, you know, high profile work within industry as well. Um, it's, it's been disclosed in other venues that obviously Google is using R, Facebook is using R, Twitter is using R, a lot of these, uh, internet, you know, giants, so to speak, are using R, but of course that's involved with other industries as well, the life sciences, financial sector, you know, governments using R, I mean, what have you, there, there are many, many places are using R now. And so one of the bigger stories that happened this year was the launch of what's called the R Consortium. And the goal of the R Consortium is basically it's a, a joint partnership of uh, many organi uh, a few key organizations, mainly um, our studio is part of this. Microsoft is part of this. Those are um, platinum members, um, Tipco software. Google, HP, Mango Solutions, um, Oracle, and a couple others are all part of this consortium. The idea of this is to basically put in more, it's not only just financial support to enhance the future development of R, but to give a mechanism for those in the community to apply for basically grants, or you know, you might think of research grants if you're in academia, but grants to help improve something with either the R, you know, 
R itself or even just a community aspect of R. So it's really meant to help bolster the efforts of the R Foundation. And again, it's not meant to replace the R Foundation, it's to complement it. And, you know, it's interesting that it's the Linux Foundation that's, you know, it, providing the basis for this consortium. And so that to me kind of speaks to how important R is just not only in statistics in general or data science, if you will, but just as far as the open source community itself to give all of us, you know, with free software that we can inspect, you know, the code under the hood. It gives all of us the capability of conducting, you know, cutting edge research and analysis using R without having to pay a single dime for it. So this is really, I think, going to take a lot of things to another level and of course i'm happy that it's not just one particular member of the industry that's dominating this consortium um it's it's again a, a collection of different organizations and it, it was i can't remember how recent it was since the consortium was launched but um recently hadley wickham who of course we mentioned earlier was elected as the chair of the infrastructure steering committee and this committee is basically helping to, you know, give a direction, so to speak, on some of the specific efforts that the consortium will concentrate on. And speaking of these efforts, um, they have invited members of the community to submit proposals for new projects um, that the consortium would consider. And when they find a project that, you know, they they deem would be obviously valuable enough to provide support, they would give that group of researchers a grant, a financial grant to actually carry out that research. So the first grant that's been awarded is to, um, now I know I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, so please don't get mad at me if you're listening, but uh, Gabor Sardi, uh, again, I probably butchered that a lot. Um, ironically, he is the author of the, uh, the Metacran site that we just mentioned in the Community Roundup. Um, but he, he had a proposal to implement something called R Hub, which basically is a complement infrastructure to CRAN in terms of developing, you know, building and testing packages in a more, ro you know, more um, robust framework. And it's really meant to provide a lot more automation around this process and to hopefully help le ease some of the burden that's been put on the R, you know, the CRAN, the, the R archive network maintainers, because in the end, somebody has to look at each of these package submissions one by one and either, you know, approve them for publication on CRAN or get back to the package authors and say, hey, here's what needs to be changed. I mean, there have been some complaints from some de developers about the transparency around this or maybe some feedback they got. I'm not getting into those details, but what I will say is, having a more robust infrastructure that again ties in automation through say automated testing on demand you know spinning up of customized servers or services to bring package authors a new way of not only publishing their package but also having a form of continuous integration and distribution so that you can also be sure that your package works not just on say windows but also it works on mac and and different versions of Linux, as well as just different versions of R itself. Um, so I think this is obviously a very valuable effort, and I'll be keeping a close eye on this for myself personally as I start to think about revisions to the packages I have on CRAN, as well as possibly making some new packages that I'll be able to hopefully tap into this service to make that whole process even easier. So to me, there's... There's only the only thing that can happen from this are good things. I can't imagine any bad things happening from this, especially since it's not meant to replace CRAN. It's really to give basically a much needed boost to the CRAN and its maintainers to make this whole process easier. And the last kind of major story with respect to industry um, and, and R in general that I'll highlight is um, earlier this year, uh, Microsoft actually acquired Revolution Analytics. So if you're not familiar with Revolution Analytics, they've been, um, for the past few years, if not longer, they've been one of the basically commercial vendors that provides a customized version of R. And they have some 
packages that come with that enterprise installation to help support, you know, processing bigger data sets without getting into like the memory footprints that or the lack of memory, I should say, um, that typically happens if you don't do any enhancements to R. So they've been offering their R, you know, revolution package um, in terms of for enterprises. And so Microsoft actually purchased them this year. And I have a, a few different quotes um, that I picked out from the, um, the, the post where they announced this acquisition. Um, one of the tidbits that you'll see in my, my notes is they made a specific call out about the fact that Revolution R Enterprise is able to deliver speeds 42 times faster than competing technology from SaaS. So I meant, I, I read this a couple of times. I'm like, did I read what I just read? And I'm not even getting into the fact that it's 42 times faster, whatever. But the fact that, and perhaps, now this is my conjecture. So this is the opinion of me and only me only. But I've always felt that SaaS was pretty closely tied with Microsoft. And the fact that Microsoft is basically calling out the fact that with Revolution R, they're going to, you know, beef up, you know, speeds of, you know, analytics, if you will, that I don't know, that that seems to me that's that's a pretty big statement in terms of R being more at the getting at, at more at the forefront of the mind share of using of what industry is using in terms of, you know, statistical and analysis or data science work or predictive analysis. So, I mean, I'll be honest, I've never been the biggest fans of Microsoft, but with that said, I'm always going to never turn down the fact that if this acquisition helps bring back some improvements back to like the open source version of R or just to the community in general, I have no issue with that at all because I'm, again, we're, I'm, it sounds cliche, but we're all in this together, if you will. And um, to bring R more at the forefront in terms of, you know, leading the bleeding edge of analytics, I'm happy to, to, to have more people involved. And so I'll also link to a post from David Smith back when he, when this acquisition took place of what a post that he did on his Revolutions blog. Um, so it really sounds like they're going to keep a lot of things hopefully very similar, but they're just going to have a lot more resources in terms of, you know, some initiatives that they'll bring forward. And of course, they're going to be able to enhance Revolution R quite a bit um, with, with this much uh, bigger boost in funding, if you will. I'm already hearing about facts that they're going to try and integrate R and probably Revolution R within Microsoft's version of SQL Server, if you will. But I'm sure there's going to be a lot more than this coming up. Um, I know some people are asking, I don't know if it was in comments or what, that maybe Excel will one day have R integrated in without any extra effort. Who knows? Um, again, I'm not the biggest fan of using spreadsheets for my analytical work. But hey, if I, if I turn back time, I'm sure I would have not turned down using R um, as the basis of statistical processing for any Excel sheets back when I was much younger. So Again, I'm, I have no issues with that. And again, it's to me, the story is more on this trend of R becoming more at the forefront of many different industries than that this is just one more example of that combined with, as I mentioned earlier, the R consortium uh, being formed as well. So yeah, those are, again, I could have highlighted a lot more news stories than that, but I figured those are kind of the two biggest I picked out. And again, with the theme of, you know, R being really coming to the forefront of industry in general. So I think that for for hope for being off for two years, hopefully this this went a little hopefully smooth for all of you listening. I admit I'm trying to get back into my flow, so to speak, um, of, of podcasting. So I apologize for any of the verbal miscues or whatever. Um, but I'm looking forward to the next episodes in which we really start exploring you know shiny itself because i've been able to learn a lot along my recent work and i want to really highlight some of the community efforts in terms of not only shiny itself but some of the applications of using shiny and how that's tying into this whole concept of interactive you know dynamic interfaces 
So I think that is going to wrap up episode 14 of the R podcast. I'm very confident that we won't have another two-year layoff between episodes. Um, but until next time, please uh, visit our home site of r-podcast.org. You'll find each episode, including this one, posted there. I have feeds for the MP3 and OGG format of the podcast episodes that you can put in your uh, podcasting software. And by the time you listen to this, I'm hoping that the iTunes link will start working again. But if not, please go ahead and use the other feeds until I get that straightened out. Um, so thank, and if you have feedback for the episode, I can't forget that. Um, please send me an email to the rcast, uh, that's one word, T H E R C A S T at gmail.com. I'm looking forward to bringing back listener feedback as part of the, the, uh, the, uh, segments here, but with a two year layoff, I didn't have much to, to choose from this time, but I do want to give a shout out to those that have been asking, Hey, what's happened to the podcast and stuff. And I'm happy to say that we're, we're back up and running. So that's going to do it for this episode. Until next time. End of line.